the roundtable discussion is on the secret of scientific writing, the unwritten rules. Uh, I would like to start with uh, introducing uh, Maria Laura Bolognesi, Professor of Medicinal Chemistry and Director of the Chemistry and Pharmaceutical Technologies degree program at the University of Bologna. She received her PhD in Pharmaceutical Sciences in 1996 and carried out a postdoctoral work at the University of Minnesota. Her research explores the development of small molecules in the neurodegenerative and neglected tropical disease therapeutic areas. Maria Laura has a track record of more than 160 publications in high ranked scientific journals, including patents and patents application, and numerous invited talks worldwide. She, she was also awarded of many visiting professorships from Complutense University of Madrid, from University of Brasilia, and from University of Caen, Normandy. And she's also associate editor of the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry and serves in the advisory board of the European Federation for Medi of Medicinal Chemistry. So welcome, Maria Laura. Thank you very much. Such a pleasure to have you here. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here, to be part of the community. If you look at my t-shirt, <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> and now I'm introducing Dr. Yves Oberson. He obtained his PhD in 1990 at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, Switzerland. He joined the Novartis Institute for, Chem for Biomedical Research in Basel in 1992 after a postdoctoral training in chemical biology at Affimax in Palo Alto, USA. He is currently executive director in Global Discovery Chemistry, where his research group develops tracers for clinical imaging. Uh, previously, he was head of chemistry of neuroscience and played the leading role in the discovery and development of drug candidates for the treatment of epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease, and narcolepsy. Dr. Robertson is the president of the European Federation of Medicinal Chemistry. So welcome president and past president of the Division of Medicinal Chemistry and Chemical Biology of the Swiss Chemical Society. So welcome Yves. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. We're so happy to have the president for this very important first event. And let me introduce the last panelist, Professor Stuart Conway. He is professor of organic chemistry at University of Oxford and the E.P. Abram uh, Cephalosporin fellow in organic chemistry at uh, St. Charles College, Oxford. He studied chemistry with medicinal chemistry at the University of Warwick before undertaking a PhD studies with Professor David Jane and Professor Jeff Watkins at the University of Bristol. Stuart completed his postdoctoral studies with Professor Andrew Holmes at the University of Cambridge. In 2003, he was appointed as lecturer in bioorganic chemistry at University of St. Andrews. In 2008, appointed as associate professor at Oxford. And in October 2014, he was promoted to full professor. Between March and August 2013, Stuart was a visiting associate at the California Institute of Technology. Since 2016, he has been an associate editor for the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, and he is the president-elect of the RSC Organic Division. His research focuses on the development of chemical tools to study biological systems. So welcome, Stuart. Welcome on board. And Thank we can start our discussion. I would like to start with some questions we made for you, and uh, we would like to know your opinion. Uh, let's start with this. Uh, how would you describe a good scientific paper from the point of view of a researcher and an academic editor? Uh, Maria Laura, would you like to start to okay. open the discussion? <laughs> okay, this is a very difficult question, but I want to take the challenge to try to reply to this question. And uh, yeah, as we said, it's very difficult because to me, a good paper is just the perfect blend of several important attributes. And usually these are, as we already heard by David, um, novelty, of course, uh, technical quality of the paper and also the clarity of the presentation. These are the even the parameters that usually reviewers are called upon to judge when they review papers. So these are the points, but of course this is uh, something, uh, it's not a personal reply. So if I should say what myself as an author, as a reviewer and as an editor, I consider what is the, the, 
The thing that uh, mostly impressed me is, uh, of course, the novelty of the paper, the impact, and even uh, a such kind of uh, sort of uh, creativity that you find on the paper. And um, so I know, especially for the students that are listening to us, it's not easy to have um, a paper of high creativity, of high impact, but for sure, if I can give a suggestion to them, is that when you start to write a paper, I'm on, on the, very much on the side of David, you have to tell the story. You have to tell to the readers the story, so it's very important to focus on the rationale. How much time do I have for these uh, questions? So how many details should... Okay, I, try, I would try to, yeah. to be short. Yeah, I try to be short and we will have the opinion okay. of everyone. And then maybe if, uh, I have some other question and we will check if there are also okay. questions okay. from the audience. No, because I want to hear also the other people who are yeah. sitting at the table. So that's why I want to be very short. Okay, so uh, I, I was telling that it's very important to write uh, the rationale. I appreciate a lot of the paper, uh, which have the rationale very clear. And this is also a tip that I can give to the student because if you focus on the rational, then you, you, you can position your paper on the background and then it's very easy to have the hypothesis and then to the aim of the paper and, the, and then the results and discussion just follow on. So this is my first point on that. But I would like to stop here and to listen to the other's opinion. I will move to Stuart, the other editor. What about you? <laughs> to have the editorial view complete. <laughs> I, I, I agree with a lot of what um, David and Maria, Maria, Maria Laura have said. I think the only the thing I'd add that I think is key, for me, a, a good paper, um, the conclusions are supported by the data presented. And, and I think it's important that um, you, you want to tell a story and, and you want to get your information across but that um, you're not overclaiming um, what you've done um, in an attempt to maybe make your paper seem very high impact and this, this thing that we're all worried about. Um, and as long as, the, as long as the conclusions correlate with the data presented and the data has been interpreted um, in, a, in an appropriate way, then for me, that's a, that's a strong paper. You know, we've all published high impact papers and, and, and um, perhaps more um, focused studies um, but um, but they can all be good papers if you see what I mean. Okay, thanks. And uh, uh, let's uh, see what the president thinks about uh, what is a good scientific paper. So ah. if yeah, so a good scientific paper, of course, can come in many flavors. And uh, I would say that really the contents uh, defines, of course the value of a paper, but at the end of the day, it's not just the content. It's also, as was said before, the way it is told. It has to be concise and intelligible. It has to be credible. It has to be uh, presented in a way that gives a little bit of perspective about the domain. Um, and uh, I think that by combining all these elements, it is possible maybe not to achieve the perfect paper, but at least to write uh, a perfectly decent one, which sometimes a content that varies. There are small stories that are worth telling, and there are very big ones that are really revolutionary. Yeah, so we we, we cannot always expect the same from uh, from every paper, every manuscript. But I think if the manuscript itself manages within a reasonable amount of time to communicate an idea and convince, then uh, this is a good scientific paper. Very nice. Uh, David, would you like to add something or summarize? Yeah, I think in general that, that we, we said the important things that number one is content. It needs to be credible and that whatever you're concluding is indeed supported by the right experiments and that you know what's good, but that it is not overreaching or overselling something that you've supported the good science um, by the proper experiment the good conclusions by the proper experiments there uh, that it's complete that it's a full story you're not just presenting data and that you presented it in a proper way and concise in a direct way and i think if you have all of these elements and that will fare really well uh, in peer review and once it gets to the readers once it's published that will be considered a very good paper thanks 
since we have a lot of um, young people in the audience, I think that Maria Laura raised a very important point. Uh, tips to give for students. What are the tips that would you give for students that are writing maybe their thesis or their first manuscript? Uh, Maria Laura, would you add something else besides what you said or? Um, there are several tips. I don't know. Maybe I want to start with something that the authors in general and even the students don't have to do. Okay, let's put it in that way. Okay. So what, uh, what are the errors that uh, someone who is going to write a paper shouldn't do? And uh, I want to focus a little bit on uh, citation because maybe to the young investigators, they don't put a lot of attention on this topic, but uh, this is very critical. And especially in the um, current uh, uh, university system where citation is even so important for uh, career progression, we should uh, um, teach this, the students, the PhD student, how to make the right citation in their thesis and their scientific articles. So um, this is something that maybe uh, ourselves uh, as mentors uh, um, don't uh, do too much, but this is something that we should teach to them because it's important for the students, for the community, for the editors, and even, as I said, for all the academic system in general. So it's important even to know uh, what is the right background and even uh, how much you should, by considering your paper with respect to what the others have done or even the improvements with respect to your previous work, it's very important to think about the citations and auto citation. This is something that maybe it's not, uh, was not mentioned so far. So this is something that I want to suggest to the student, pay attention to that, and even work a lot on the right of auto citation. Thanks, Maria Laura. Uh, Stuart, would you add something about the tips uh, and uh, what to do and what not do to do at this point? Because I think it's very important also to focus on this. Yeah, so I, I think, I guess a lot of people are probably writing or trying to write at the, at the moment. Many of us are out of the lab. So I think this is potentially quite useful. Um, so I, I think if you're starting to write, if you're starting to write your PhD thesis or a paper manuscript, usually the first word is the hardest one. So um, I, I recommend to my students that they um, make a folder on their computer called thesis quite early on and then you've overcome that energy barrier, the activation barrier for doing that um, and put in some files, you know, introduction and, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, and then I think David had a very good tip in his talk. So we, we like to try and write things in chunks. So when we're planning papers and we've done a lot of that recently, we'll start with the heading of the paper, the title of the paper and then subheadings and then um, perhaps think about figures that might go in those sections and then and then we fill those in and you can write write things in small chunks um so uh, I, and i think that's a very helpful way of, of writing things it makes it a little bit more um accessible um and i think the other thing to remember perhaps when we when we end up going back in the lab or for people who are continuing to work in the lab try and do a bit of writing every day or every week it's it's like anything else if you practice it you get better at it and so if you don't do it for a long time, you wouldn't, you know, go and run or, or, or play football or something, having not done it for um, 10 years, you wouldn't then go out and suddenly run 26.2 miles or, or whatever, right? So you'd, um, you need to keep, keep um, practicing your writing. But I think the key tip is to break it into small chunks and, and write in those, in those sections. Okay. Yves, would you like to add something about your industrial view and uh, maybe add something about uh, also reports and something like that, tips for write everything? Yeah, so in the industry, I don't think that we write papers differently from academia. At for the sure. end of the day, it's science, yeah. Uh, but I, one element that I would like to maybe mention is that I, I like to think of a publication not as something that you do at the very end of a project, but as something that accompanies you. So you should really, as you go through your project and advance in your science, you should really think of what 
what am I really going to do? What am I trying to achieve? What story am I going to tell? And if I have good results, how am I going to present them? It's, it's too easy to you know, just go through the, 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 the day work and then uh, at the end of the day, end up in a situation where we could have a fantastic story to tell, but then realize that, oh, I didn't do this characterization or maybe I should have made this additional derivative to be able to make my point. Yeah. So starting early on, in the, the process of thinking at least about the publication, as Stuart was mentioning, by writing little chunks of it and maybe adding to it little by little, building it slowly but surely, uh, I think is a really important element. And I would encourage that, uh, well, as a scientist, we, we always know what project we're working on, what story we have, why we do things. And at the end of the day, if this is clear, then the structure of the publication should be also relatively clear and easy to establish. Thanks. Uh, David, would you like to add something? And I would like to, to, to bring the question to another level. Uh, is there anything that you wish writer uh, could stop minimize doing something that you really can't uh, stand anymore <laughs> about the papers you are receiving? Yeah, it's, it's, it's usually a mix of, of overcomplicating uh, the work and the language and also uh, this overselling when you have conclusions that are not really backed by, by the proper experiments. And then this is when it's really bad, it's really obvious even at, at submission when we start evaluating the work. So really just, you know, when you're publishing something, you're writing something to be reviewed by, by other scientists and you want to publish it, Make sure that whatever you're concluding there really properly is supported and that you haven't overcomplicated things uh, because that, you know, that, that's crucial when, when it gets evaluated by, by others. And uh, the, this question also for Maria Laura and Stuart that are working as editor, uh, is there something that you really can't stand anymore and you would suggest to avoid <laughs> to writers? <laughs> well, so it's, it's, it's the, the papers that um, the conclusions are not supported by the data. That, that's, the, that's the thing. I mean, I think, um, at Jamie, can we, we try and send most of the papers out for review, but, but a paper where we've read it and we don't feel that the conclusions are supported by the data, would, we wouldn't um, ask reviewers to spend time on, on that. Um, and that, yeah, so that's my, that's my thing in, in that. I agree, of course. 100% this is the most important thing if I can add something very trivial but maybe that can be useful I suggest especially the young uh, investigators uh, to look very carefully at the guidelines because we spend a lot of times in a sending back manuscript because they do not adhere to the guidelines and this is something that should be very easy to do I know it's sometimes boring but I would suggest to all our authors to read the guidelines because this will save a lot of time. It will expedite the process. So I don't know. I, I said, Stuart, this is trivial, but of course, your is was your main point. But even these uh, less important tips uh, are important. I don't know, David. Uh, do you agree with, with that? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, sometimes some of these guidelines we don't think of. So, for instance, like. Uh, uh, templates, you know, a lot of these things like templates, they're not necessarily for your editors, um, they're for your, your reviewers, you know, you want to please your reader. And a lot of these, these journals, we use, you know, similar, the same, the same referees for, for decades now, and they're used to reading things in a certain way. And so all of a sudden, if they receive something that's completely different and not properly formatted, you're adding that tiny bit of frustration to them. And you need to remember, these are people, you know, you don't want a frustrated, tired, scientist evaluating your work because no matter how much they want to focus on that the science and the data there you don't want someone frustrated reading through your paper because that might be the difference between you know a, a, a neutral you know borderline evaluation and them thinking that this is fantastically written work uh, so make it easy for for your evaluators it's a minor thing but yeah it can affect things Early stage researcher, a nice topic, and we have a question about that. The question is from Gianlucas Bardella. You probably you probably know him very well, the president <laughs> of the Medicinal <laughs> Chemistry Division of the Italian Chemical Society, who is following us uh, on YouTube. 
and uh, he's asking Maria Laura, David, Stuart, Eves, which is your suggestion for early stage researcher? Is better to go for a single but very complete and comprehensive study or to publish more papers using data as soon as they come out? Hey, John. Uh, John? The president. Oh, the president, please, please. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So that's not the, resp the response of an editor, that's the response of somebody working in industry and uh, receiving occasionally CVs and having to judge them and uh, you know, select potential future collaborators. Yeah. I would say that when I go through the list of publications, of course I will look at uh, you know, the journals in which they've been published. It's to a certain extent a, con a confirmation of a certain quality, but I will also try to see how relevant the content is. So I, I might not necessarily favor somebody with five publications on one topic and with small incremental stories. Uh, would, I would probably prefer to see something that is a little more solid that shows that the person can really provide an overview of a domain and have a real scientific impact. And, and favoring quality over uh, over quantity, but it is my personal opinion. There might be different opinions in yeah. academia. Maybe Stuart, Maria Laura, you would look at these things differently. I'm curious <laughs> to know uh, something about Maria Laura because in Italy we are asked we are asked to reach certain numbers for the habilitation. So <laughs> it's yeah, important for me to know <laughs> the opinion <laughs> of a professor no. like Maria Laura. Let's Let's try to be pragmatic. Of course, uh, we should try to combine quality and quantity. I wish uh, we cannot say, no, okay, just one paper in nature is enough because otherwise you cannot to participate to the competition. These are the rules. And so we have even to deal with them. But for sure, I, I hate uh, salami publications when uh, there is only one project that is divided in several. Uh, different publication. This is something that I really hate. And when I'm in a committee, I, of course, uh, uh, even in Italy, this is something that uh, I'm not favoring. And I don't give eye mark to a guy with, a, with, with, with only one project split in several or more publications. Mm -hmm. just to be, this is just to be, to, to be short, but it's a very difficult topic, of course. Yeah. Okay, Stuart, what do you think? Yeah. So, yeah, so I'll, I'll balance the view. I mean, I, I agree. I think we need to be pragmatic. Um, John Luca asked specifically about early career researchers. So I think, um, I think when you start your independent career, I think it's important to get a publication out fairly early on to show people your ideas and what you're working on and, and the kind of things you're interested in. Um, and that doesn't have to be in nature or science or, or, or whatever. It can, it can be in, in other journals. And I think it inspires confidence in people that you're, um, you, you know, you're, you're able to do independent research. And then I think this is true for all of us going all, all the way through our career. Um, I don't think most of us can't only publish in science or, or nature or nature X or, or whatever. Um, and I think we need to think about our students and postdocs as well. It's important for their career to get publications. And so sometimes projects don't um, work out perfectly and, and you can't get all of the things that, that you need. And so I think publishing at an appropriate point where you can help that person's career by getting a paper is, is important um, as well. So you, you, need a bal you need a balance, but um, I'd say put a marker down fairly early on if you're starting your independent career. And what about you, David? Would you add something? I agree with that balance. So that's, there's that practical practicality that you need to consider when you have different university or country or institutional requirements to consider with, uh, about uh, as an early, you know, early stage researcher. Um, but you know, when you're starting out, you do need, want, as an independent researcher, you do want to have your name out there. And so I think you shouldn't wait that long for the huge story, at least for your first couple, you know, sometimes uh, a lot of junior professors are starting their independent research, you know, they, they try and look at, at specific mini reviews or reviews that they can write that, you know, complete what's already in literature just to establish also 
um, you know, themselves working in that specific field. Uh, and then you start with, again, what Stuart said, specific publications, maybe in smaller journals, because again, that's your community, that's your audience. And this is the, the, this is the group of people uh, whom you want to, to know you as a researcher. So that's crucial. Um, in terms of salami slicing, you should never do that. You know, don't just publish for the sake of publishing and, and just for the sake of reaching that number. Um, I think that's a very bad practice. Uh, and you shouldn't be doing salami slicing anyway. That's ethically problematic. Um, but it's, it's considering all of these together. And unfortunately, you know, we have these institutional requirements and nation, national requirements that I hope do change eventually so that people can really, especially young, early career researchers, focus on doing the work that they want to do and the good science and that they're not bound by just publication requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the thing that we want to change in the future and why we're, we're doing these discussions and these talks, because you watching are the future of this, this entire you know, endeavor, scientific endeavor and, and publishing. So. Think about all of those when you yourselves become these high professors later on and the things that you can change. Yeah, thank you, David. I would continue with you with the next question uh, that is uh, uh, very important in this period of quarantine because I think many people have been writing reviews in this period. So could you, could you kindly comment on review article preparation? It is not always easy to invent an exciting story. Mm -hmm. So for reviews, um, the first one that you need to consider is uh, you don't want to be redundant. You don't want to cover things that have already been covered. Uh, so that's important. You need to be aware of what the most recent reviews are and how and what studies are included there. Um, and then when you write reviews, a nice thing that we consider, especially for our journals, is that it's something didactic. You're teaching something and you're discussing something. something. You're not just making a list of previous compounds or previous experiments done. That can be a very long and a full review, but when you read it, it's, it's rather empty because you know, there's, there's insight missing. Uh, and so when you make reviews, don't just make it for the sake of, of writing and presenting all of these previous experiments and previous papers done. There still needs to be a point to that review and why you're presenting that information now and why you're grouping these uh, certain papers together. And I think that's crucial because even if it's a long review, your, your referees and your readers will also call you out on that and will feel that you know, it's a badly written review. They won't get the point of it. That motivation should be clear as well. What about the others? Do you have any suggestions about uh, writing review articles and the storytelling in them? Maybe. Maybe Stuart, I can uh, point out that in Jamet Camel we have a perspective and I love perspectives because they are not just reviews, but they give uh, the perspective of the authors in the field. And this is a suggestion for the reviews. When you write a review, so if you can put something that is a perspective, of course, uh, the reviews will be much more appreciated of high, higher value. Yeah, I, I agree. There has to be an intellectual contribution there. Um, and that, that intellectual contribution can group together um, a, a body of literature. Um, I think you can also point out what's not there in the literature. It can perhaps define what, what could be done, what needs to be done next as well. And so I think, um, yeah, I mean, we've written quite a few review articles and I'd like to think in, in, in the majority of them, there's actually, um, yeah, there's a proper analysis of the literature and, and an intellectual contribution there as, as well. They're hard work to write as well. Would you like to add your view, Yves? Yeah, when I, when I read a review, I actually really appreciate when there is some intellectual contribution, just a compilation of a long list of the articles relative to the topic is, is not good enough. Yeah. So if you write a review, please try to give an overall image of the field, please try to give a story also behind uh, what has been tried, what has been achieved, what didn't work, and, and what comes next. And uh, if, you, if you can put all this in a review, I will really enjoy reading it. Yeah. I would like to continue with the next question with you, Yves, because uh, it's some, there is something related to industry. How about publishing a patent as research paper? Is there anything that should be considered before submission to a journal? 
So I'm, I'm not sure exactly what is the background of this question exactly, but uh, in general, um, when we come to the end of a project, um, the end being a positive or negative end, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we, have, we have different objectives. And uh, of course, uh, in terms of patenting, it can be because we have identified something promising and we want to continue the development of a molecule. We still want to be able to talk about it later, but the first step is, of course, to defend our intellectual property. And that can be done because the compound is good or because we're in a very competitive area and we think we might come back to it or it might be useful in other ways. Or the chemotype is very different from what we know usually and there might be other applications. So there's, there's plenty good reasons for patenting. Now, uh, patenting only for publishing is not worth it. Uh, it costs a lot of money, of course, especially when you come to the prosecution of the patent and the, the translations and all this. It's, it's a lot of work and a lot of money. Uh, so if there is not a commercial benefit behind it, we will typically not patent, we will publish rather. Um, the, the patenting process takes some time. So very often, once we have written the patent, which is purely a description of the invention, um, we need to wait a little bit before um, the point has been achieved, has been reached when we can write the publication. As you know, once a publication has been submitted, there is one year uh, during which you can make modifications to this, um, uh, to this um, application. And then another six months before it is published. Um, if you time things well, it actually delays uh, a little bit your publication, but not so much. Um, and very often, to be honest, in a project, even when we want to patent, there is part of, a, part of the project that we can publish relatively quickly um, because uh, not everything is directly relevant to the potential commercial applications of a project. So I'm not sure whether I answered the question really, but um, a few elements at least to think about. Yeah, interesting elements have been added, I think, yeah. Uh, what about the editors? If they have any comments on translating a patent to a publication? So, so I, I mean, I guess obviously, obviously you'd need to, 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 to read, you know, a patent and a publication are two very different documents as yeah. Eve has, has said. Um, and that there needs to be the, the, the setting of your work in the context of the literature and, and the story that we've, we've discussed. Um, I mean, they're, they're two important components of science, but, but we should understand that, that they're slightly different as well. Patents are reviewed, but for different things to papers and patents are peer reviewed um, in the same way that, that papers are. And I think that's why we value papers, why we value publications is because someone else who's an expert in our community has looked at it and, and, and sort of agreed with our interpretation or perhaps in, helped us with our interpretation when they've reviewed the paper. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think you could be in a scenario, and I'm not sure this, I don't think this is what the question intended, but um, you, you're not in a scenario where you can cut and paste from a patent into a, into a manuscript template and send it send it off, but that's not going to work very well. Um, but yeah, the, the peer review for me is the key component of the papers. Okay. Uh, I would like to make another question to you. Uh, what about the number of authors? Is there any prejudice about articles with a lot of authors? <laughs> no. Well, I'll take this one maybe. Um, in, um, in the industry, Medicinal chemistry is extremely interdisciplinary. And uh, for a project, we might uh, involve people who are, of course, doing the chemistry, but they're doing the biology, they're do developing the assays, they're doing maybe the radiochemistry, they are doing uh, you know, all kinds of characterizations on our compounds, uh, sometimes with contributions that are really important for the story. And uh, we have to include them all. We have to recognize all the people who have actually contributed in. Uh, concrete manner to the development of the project that is being published. So yes, sometimes we have a lot of authors. Um, it's, you know, there is no set rule in how many authors you should have in a publication. Of course, uh, they should all be relevant. Uh, but um, my personal opinion is that, no, I won't have a prejudice for um, a long list of authors provided they all come from uh, different angles. So I, I wouldn't want to see, as we see sometimes in, um, in clinical trials, a long list of authors who are actually only the participants to the clinical trial. We wouldn't want to see a long list of chemists because they just belong to the same company. They will have to 
have contributed, all of them. And we will want to see uh, the, the biologists, the pharmacologists, and all the other partners who have really contributed to the project also in the list of authors. So that's, um, that's how I see it. It's very viable depending on the project, but there is no absolute uh, limit in uh, how many authors we should have. Okay. Do the others have any yeah. opinion about this? Maria Laura? I want to, to reinforce Yves' view because even uh, in my case, uh, working in academia, I, I don't have a, a huge group, so I have to rely on collaboration to develop a project. So in my papers, I have several authors, but this does not mean that I don't pay attention to authorship because this is a, a very critical point. And uh, we should again teach the students about authorship and uh, um, how we should consider a contribution relevant, as he was suggesting before. So uh, I don't no prejudice on many names, but of course, if someone is uh, listed there, this means that they have contributed in a significant way. Yeah, I agree. Please, please, um, no, no, no prejudice about. Um... The, the the number of authors for the acceptance or the rejection of a paper yeah okay i agree just to add like authorship is something that that is really determined by the authors you know it's something that we don't touch as editors especially as professional editors it's something that you decide as a group particularly whoever your correspondence authors are you know the primary investigators and you need to remember that it's not just adding you know a name it's not as simple as that adding someone with a small contribution every author is responsible for your that paper so it doesn't matter if it's one author two authors or 20 of you there every name that you add there is responsible for the entire content of that paper you know if it's received well or if there are problematic things happening there, every name you add there is just as responsible for that paper. And so you need to consider that gravity of responsibility when you add a name to that paper. You know? So you shouldn't be adding names as a thank you or selling these names. Yes. These are completely unethical. So if you end up becoming a, a senior professor and corresponding author later on, these are things that you need to consider really closely because it is something that we consider a sacred responsibility of being an author, a co-author of a paper. Yeah, we have a question for the editors. What is the criteria or basis you use to select reviewers? People, yeah. who, are, people who are experts in the... In the <laughs> um, so um, we, yeah, I, I mean, we get, we get the paper in. I mean, I'm sure it works, it's similar in most journals. So we'll get the paper in um, and we'll, we'll take a read of it and, and decide that it's gonna go out to review. And then we'll check that the, um, some critical components have been, have been met so that the reviewers have got the information that they need. Um, and then, um, I mean, we have a, we have a system um, at JMA Chem and I'm sure it's the same at other journals that will suggest some reviewers for you. And we might take some um, advice from that. We, we will take into account the, author, the reviewers suggest, suggested by the authors, but we'll also use our own um, knowledge and expertise to select people that can, can review the paper um, well. Usually we deal with um, papers that are quite close, closely um, related to our own field of research, and, and that's, that's pretty helpful. I'm sure the others can, can add to that. Okay. Maybe I can add something uh, that, uh, at least in my opinion, okay, I believe that this is one of the most critical points for um, the success of the, all the editorial process. So I take a lot of time, in, I select the reviewers with care, like everyone does. And, uh, but um, another point, the reviewers should be expert, but they should uh, even uh, uh, know the journal. So, for example, um, reviewers that are in editorial board, on the editorial board, of course, these are the most preferred reviewers. This is not possible because and we, we like to rely even on young reviewers uh, as soon as they got the SES reviewers uh, certificates, but uh, of course, uh, to me, the two points are very expert in the field, but also they should know 
the journal and the, the, the medicinal chemistry discipline. And because we are a very multidisciplinary field, I mean that uh, we should select the people that know the field and the discipline. Nice. Uh, we are almost at the end of this round table. I would go on with one other question if you are okay. It's okay for all, for you all to go on with another question. Yeah, and then we will close. Uh, do you believe that in vivo experiments are always required for publication in high impact factor journals if the protein target is already known? <laughs> This is an old saying to me because yeah. this is a, <laughs> a usual question. I don't know who started to say that because it's a kind of mantra everywhere <laughs> that you cannot publish at least in JMED Chem if uh, you don't have in vivo data. Of course, this is not true. There was a, an editorial on that by the two editors in chief, JMED Chem. So at least for JMED Chem, you can consult that. And even because I live in a country like Italy, where we have a, a lot of focus on animal exper experimentation, and we try to uh, comply with, with the three R rules, I believe that we should focus even on other in vivo models. This would be a very long uh, conversation course, but let's start with a very good cellular model because this is uh, indispensable because uh, you have to at least uh, to look at the activity at the cellular, in the cellular context uh, to see connections, especially. And then consider also to have uh, in vivo data, but uh, on other models, like not just mouse, but like Drosophila, which, is, which are easier to handle. But uh, yes, I, 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 I stop here because I want to see what the other think yeah I think, I think it depends on on what the paper is looking at so um clearly there's some things that you can find out only through in vivo experiments and at an advanced stage in a project you'll you'll want to do those experiments to to test your compounds in that setting um but i think even if your protein target's known you can envisage very high impact papers that don't need in vivo data maybe novel binding modes of compounds um different uh, unexpected sar you know the, the the list goes on so so no it's not i don't think it's required it depends what 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 you think your study is is about yeah i would say the same thing it's something that editors will always look at on a, on a case to case basis you know it depends on the scope of your study what you what you state as the scope of your study and what you're trying to claim and we want you know support for your conclusions and and so if your claim hinges really on in vivo or preclinical pre data, then of course we would need that. But like what Stuart said, if there's something really important, like you know, a completely new synthetic protocol, total synthesis, or a really interesting SIR, and you have conclusions that are that are important in, in from, from that alone, then of course that would that would be fine. So it depends on on that story that you're trying to tell. You know, if you have conclusions that would need this in vivo data, then of course your referees and your editors will ask for that. Ibs, would you like to add something before closing? No, actually, I don't, I don't have much to add to this particular question. I think uh, all the points were made. Uh, at the end of the day, it's being able to tell a story that has a scientific value, being able to tell it well, and uh, to tell it in a way that is convincing. And uh, if you can achieve that, I suppose that uh, whatever, whatever journal you aim for, uh, if you have a, a story that really and so some interesting questions and addresses the audience of this journal um, will uh, will certainly accept it. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. I would like to personally thank all of you for your kind and important contribution, especially for the young scientists who are following the network. So thanks a lot for participating. And I will go on with the last few things before closing. So it's, a, it's been an honor uh, uh, moderating this round table with you. And uh, I hope to get in touch with you as soon as possible. And I hope you will follow all the initiative we will present in the next months. Thanks a lot again. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Thank you very much. your students Bye -bye. to follow us. Okay. <laughs> Let me conclude with the last few things. Okay.
Okay. First of all, I would like to thank you all for following us in this very interesting seminar. I think it, it has been a very productive day with uh, good research and a lot of interesting topics in the workshop and in the round table. I hope you learned something today. So I hope you will follow us in the next events we are bringing to you in the next months. Thank you very much again.